all of us in the use of games in education, including on the part of the Secretary of Education. I'm not going to play the video here, but you can you can find it there. So the quote is, Secretary of Education, Arnie Duck, and ask kids love games, so why not learn use them to teach? <laughs> so I've been interested in this for a long time. So I remember very well when I worked actually on an educational microcomputing project, as as the things were called in those days, at IBM Watson, that colleagues and I went and saw the uh, rollout of the Atari 800. Atari was, prior to the development of these machines, really a game company, so this was a microcomputer with game lineage. Uh, the Apple II had games developed for it, but it wasn't really a game machine. And I remember how excited I was seeing what would be, by the standard today, really crude and primitive games. But I had, you know, sort of sugar plums danced in my head thinking about what a wonderful learning tool this was going to be. Uh, and it would be just a great way to teach all kinds of important things. I was really excited about it. And then that excitement has persisted to some extent to the present day. It continues to be something I'm really interested in. Uh, most of what I've been doing in, in this area is in partnership with my colleague Alex Reppening. Alex has spoken to Beaver, so I, I imagine any of you know him. But uh, he didn't talk uh, really about what I'm mostly going to be talking about, which is the course he and I have offered every year for the last uh, several years, specifically on game design for education. We think we've learned something from this, and so and I guess other people thought so too, so we've actually published a book chapter on some of what we've learned about this. I might explain that gamelets is a term of art that we've introduced, so if I say gamelet, you don't think Grand Theft Auto, you think Pac-Man or Super Mario Brothers or something like that, and that, that turns out to be important uh, in, in what I'm gonna be uh, talking about. So I'm not going to be talking mainly about the really high production value, big time kinds of games. And, and it's important for us to communicate about this because if we're not clear on this, the course fills up with students who want a course on Grand Theft Auto, and that's not what we're, <laughs> we're doing. So we, we think we have learned some things there, but uh, I think what we've learned mainly is negative. Uh, I put the my in magenta there because you can't blame Alex for anything I'm going to be saying. Alex <laughs> tends to have a somewhat more optimistic take than I do. So this is definitely my view. It's about work that Alex and I have done working very closely together, but this is my interpretation of what's happened, not his. Well, one of the problems, actually, that afflicts this field is that, that people kind of talk about games as if it's one big glob, but of course it isn't. And there are a lot of pieces that it's important to Distinguished. So one of the terms that Alex and I have developed in our teaching on this is that there's a category that we call cheesy games. And actually a lot of students are drawn to cheesy games. But cheesy games are cheesy because the game doesn't have anything to do with what people are learning. Right? So think of a framework in which, I don't know, you're going through a maze or something like that. And when you come to a junction in the maze, you don't get to choose a direction until you answer a quiz question. Okay? And so you answer the quiz question correctly and then you get to make a choice, otherwise something else happens or something like that. So there are a million things like that. And the thing about them is the quiz has nothing to do with the game. It's not a quiz about mazes. You're not learning about mazes, right? You're learning about, or you're testing your knowledge or learning from the quiz or whatever about something else. But anyway, that's not what I had this fantasy about when I saw the Atari 800. I didn't think, oh gee, we could have lots of quiz games. Now, there's a check, check there, because if what you want is something that's going to motivate somebody to go through a quiz, a game may be a great way to do that. But it's not the kind of learning that I and many other people have looked for. Similarly, if what you want to do is to teach skills, then games are great. So a little bit for the non-psychologists in the crowd, there's actually ever-mounting evidence that learning skills is just a different deal from learning conceptual content. It's just different, and there's lots of ways it's different. Different mechanisms, different transfer characteristics, different everything. But if skill is your thing, games are great. So has anybody done Typing of the Dead? <laughs> so this is a cool game. The skill involved is touch typing, and what you do is you kill zombies if you can 
touch type rapidly enough words that come up there that you need to type. Okay? And it's great. It makes it <coughs> painless to spend many hours, or much less painful anyway, to spend many hours practicing your touch typing. So again, great big check there. If you want to teach skills, games are terrific. One wonderful thing to be thinking about. Okay, maybe a little more controversially or complexly on the other end of it, there's another category. Uh, so these are games where you really try to convey something more cultural. Uh, the military actually has been pretty successful, it appears, with this kind of thing. The, the data on how successful they've been are not very satisfying to me, but I may just not have looked in the right place. I just should ask Susan about this. She probably no. put me on to a lot of stuff. No, I can't. All right. Anyway, Maybe so, I could give you a name. so there's there's this thing called America's <laughs> Army, for example. And the, the Army has spent a whole lot of money on this thing, and, and I, I believe the indications are that they're getting they're getting good value. And what America's Army kind of does is to give you an idea of what it's like to be in the Army. And actually, it's changed somewhat. I remember talking with someone who was in the Army about it, who said that actually one of the things they did at the beginning of this work was to convey to people that the Army is kind of boring. Because what they were finding was they were getting a lot of people who wanted to, who thought they wanted to be in the army who, who really didn't make it because it was it was too boring. They were expecting something other than what they had. Well, this was at a time when recruiting wasn't a big problem for them. More recently, when recruiting has been more difficult, they've had to turn some knobs there. But nevertheless, a game is a good way to kind of teach uh, you know, what it's like to be in some sort of environment. But there's this stuff in the middle, and I'm going to put that big red X there. So this is where we're trying to teach ideas. So ideas in math or ideas in science. That's what I was imagining when I saw the Atari 800. But, whoops, what the talk is about there is that that gets an X. We don't know how to do this, I argue. Okay, now the title is not Game Design for Education, Provably Impossible. <laughs> the title is Game Design for Education, Not So Easy. Okay, so, so as we'll see, I'm not, I'm not saying this can't be done. I'm saying we haven't been able to do it. And in the process of trying, I think we've learned a lot about what makes it hard to do that. But this is the focus, right? So again, if you're a person who loves games and, and you like the idea of using games to teach skills, great. This is not what I'm talking about. It's great, but it's something else. Okay, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to step you through this in, in detail, but this, this course has been a kind of an iterative experiment over the years, so we keep changing it. It's going to be no, no different uh, going forward. I'm going I'm to focus on uh, some of the stuff down here rather than stuff up at the top because it's probably a, it's, it's more connected with what's, what's coming later. So one of the big problems in developing uh, in our class and having students develop it, uh, games that people learn something from is that they choose crummy learning goals. And here's an example that's not from the class, but it kind of illustrates the pathology. So a colleague in another department learned about uh, the fact that we were doing this, actually a colleague in, in, uh, in linguistics, um, Andy Cowell, some of you might know him. One of the things, Andy teaches a lot of stuff, but one of the <coughs> things that he teaches is, of course, something like Arapaho language and culture. And we were at some gathering, and he heard that Alex and I were teaching this class. He said, Jay, do you think your students could develop a game for my Arapaho language and culture class? And I said, well, maybe so. What did you have in mind? And he said, well, I was picturing that you could have on the screen a picture of a buffalo in the middle of the screen. And around the edges of the screen, you could have sort of zones that represented uses of different parts of the buffalo. And to play the game, you would drag a part of the buffalo to one of these use zones, and if it was a proper use of that part, then it would stay there, and otherwise it would come back, right? And so you'd have to learn what the use of the buffaloes were. So I said, yeah, I imagine we could do that. So tell me, do you find that your students have a lot of trouble learning the uses of parts of the buffalo? And he sort of hesitated for a moment, he said, well, well, no. <laughs> so I said, well, what's the point? Okay. So that played out over and over again in the first few iterations of this. You know, students would choose things to build games to teach where there was, there was no reason to, to build them. And one of the things we tried that didn't work was we had a requirement one year that you have to have your learning goal 
certified by a K-12 teacher. So you have to work with a K-12 teacher to come up with a learning goal. Didn't work. Why not? Well, most K-12 teachers don't have good ideas of things that they have trouble teaching. And if you think about it a little bit, you can see that something like that pretty much has to be true. Okay? Because if you're a K-12 teacher, you can't spend your time, or much of your time, teaching things you have trouble teaching. You have to have a way of teaching where mostly you're teaching stuff that people learn. Okay? And you don't spend a lot of time thinking about what the difficulties are. There are exceptions, of course, but not enough to make this a reasonable strategy to say, you know, just find a K-12 teacher and work with them. I'm, I'm not going to um, develop the, uh, the point about simulations, although if someone is interested. But, uh, but Clayton, I'm intrigued by the X's or the checks. What does that indicate? Okay, the X's are things we tried and have now turned away from. Okay. Uh, well, actually, okay, Let me again, I'll still skip the simulation thing. It, it might come in, but it probably won't. So the thing with the question mark is uh, uh, something I particularly want to talk about in a little more detail here. So seeing that the, the students, with or without the involvement of K-12 teachers, weren't doing a good job of building their games around something, reasonable uh, uh, learning goals. In the last iteration, we, we stipulated two classes of learning goals, and you had to aim your game at uh, one of these. So the first class, so we did have two, two groups because we, didn't, we, you know, we wanted the students to have at least some choice in what they would be working on. So Mike was, was kind enough to give us a terrific list of conceptual difficulties in biology. I'll tell you a lot more about that. And then the other thing that we said, well, if you don't want to do something on biology, you can do something on computing, and in particular on parallel computing. So a little bit more about both of these things. So this is just to give you an idea of, of what, the form in which we provided the stuff uh, from Mike. So Mike gave us a list. I'll actually show you Mike's list in a minute. And then we spent some time digging out resources and examples and stuff like that for students to work on. But, but here's the list, and, and I'm not going to uh, uh, take you through all of those, but just just taking the very first one there as an example to kind of give you the flavor uh, of it. And we'll talk about some of the other ones a little bit later on. So Mike reports, and I guess other people do too, that one of the difficulties students have in particular understanding evolution is that they just can't conceive of three and a half billion years and what that really means in terms of a process that's repeated over that period. And I presume that geologists have exactly the same issue. Okay, that people just can't conceive of enough time for geologic processes to do what they evidently do. And so that's something that, that has to be uh, uh, wrestled with. 